Hi, I'm Dr. Sujit Ravda. I'll try to explain the relation between diuretics and renal handling of calcium today and see how they interact with each other. Now, before we go there, how do oral diuretics act? One sentence answer of their mechanistic action. They all inhibit sodium reabsorption in the tubular epithelial cells. Now, we know that at the level of the glomeruli, which is here, with a GFR of 125 ml per minute, we make about 180 liters of urine here. But at the end, we bring out just two liters. So more than 99% of the water in the lumen is actually reabsorbed. Majority of this reabsorption is not water being actively reabsorbed, but it's just that water passively follows the sodium. It's only when I come to the last portion of the tubules and we're collecting that, that antidiuretic hormone directly pulls back water, but that's just two to three percent of the total. So more than 95, 96 percent of the 180 liter of water is actually reabsorbed because it's passively following the sodium. And diuretics act by the simple principle of inhibiting sodium reabsorption. But then the question is, why are these cells so hungry for sodium? Why would they keep begging for sodium? That's because these cells, the tubular lining cells all throughout the tubule are hungry, they're deficient for sodium. Now, what makes them deficient for sodium is that on the side, now I'm just, I'm just trying to do a magnified vision of one of those cells, or two of those cells actually, on the side facing the blood volume or the blood capillaries, you have got sodium potassium ATPase channels. Now these sodium potassium ATPase channels are constantly chucking out three sodium out of the epithelial cells and pulling back two potassium into the cells, which means all these cells keep losing out three sodium constantly and keep gaining back two potassium, which means they're deficient in sodium, but they're rich in potassium. So it starts here. And hence these cells will always keep begging for sodium from the, from the tubular um, lumen, which consists of the urine. Now, if I come to the ascending limb of loop of Henle, where things like fusamide, the loop diuretics act, let's pick up one of those cells. So I've got the sodium potassium ATPase, which is constantly chucking out three sodium and bringing in two potassium. And hence the cell is deficient for sodium, as we just discussed, which makes it easy for the cell to gain sodium from the lumen. And this sodium comes in the form of sodium potassium two chloride. Now, this is electro neutral because there is one positive sodium and one positive potassium. That's two positive and two negatively charged chloride. That makes it electro neutral, which is fine for the cell. As it comes in here, the sodium is chucked out towards the lumen of the body or the blood vessels by the sodium potassium ATPase. We discussed that the cells are rich in potassium. So the potassium, the cell doesn't want any more potassium. It kicks it right back into the lumen. So you get the potassium going right back into the urinary lumen. And there's this, and this separate channel for pulling the two chloride into the body cavity or into the blood vessel. So what did the body gain? It gained one positively charged sodium here. It gained two negatively charged chloride here. And it kicked back the potassium into the urinary lumen, which means there's a net gain of one positivity in the urinary lumen. And on the body side, there's one positive and two negatively charged chlorides gain. So the body actually gained one negatively charged molecule or ion, which the body doesn't like. So there's an electrical difference now. So to maintain that, the body says, okay, I'm going to pull back some more positively charged stuff from the urinary lumen. Now, there are these small gaps between succeeding epithelial cells lining the tubule, and through that paracellular cleft, the body pulls back things like calcium and magnesium. So now if I can stop this sequence of events, I will stop the reabsorption of calcium. So if I put people on flusomite, flusomite acts by inhibiting this sodium potassium chloride uptake, and hence the remaining list of things are stopped from happening, which means calcium is not reabsorbed and hence calcium is chucked out in the urine. So that explains the logic for using frusamide in hypercalcemia. But what if someone is on thiazide diuretic, which acts here more distal? Again, my crude handwriting, hopefully it will zoom it in. So this cell, again, the same sodium potassium ATPase is constantly chucking out three sodium, bringing in two potassium. So the cell is always deficient for sodium. Here, the, the cell takes sodium in the form of sodium chloride, thankfully a much easier process than this one. So one positively charged sodium and one positively negatively charged chloride sorry, is gained by the cell. If I block this with hazard diuretic, what do you think the rest of my kidney luminous tubules are going to do? They don't like anything to be blocked. So if you block this, 
this portion and this portion of the tubule is going to say fine you block me there i'm going to act more here so these channels start to act more than they would normally act which means we draw back more sodium potassium chloride in the ascending limb of lopofenle but remember when we do that we also end up drawing back more calcium so that hopefully explains why when you put people on thiazide diuretics they can get hypercalcemia and that hopefully also tells you why fusamide helps to get rid of calcium in the urine thank you